TLO, what's poppin'? <clears throat> we are on Twitch. We're not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, man. Right behind me, you see it. Just a little warning. Don't forget, we do got twitch.com, man. That's where you can catch a live stream. Usernames at the bottom of the screen. And we also got patreon.com. Post on there about 10 times a week, including Premier League highlights. This is ex-gang member on drug dealing, violence, and surviving grooming. Lad Bible. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. Talk to me. I was born in Nigeria and um, my mother left around the age of two, so I didn't really know where she, where she was. I spent a, quite a bit of time with- Born in Nigeria, huh? Now I'm 52% Nigerian. With my, uh, my mother's mum, and then after that, I was moved over to my father's side, which is obviously staying at her mum's and his family for a bit. So that was the first time I ever met my father. Shortly after being moved over to my um, my father's mum, I would say that's crazy. Low key, like I can see the similarities. That's peak, <laughs> like the eye shape. That's crazy. Uh, my father got married to my stepmom, and for me that was obviously something quite yeah happy. I remember my father asking me, "What do I think of her?" and I absolutely thought, yeah, I love this woman. She's lovely, nicest lady I've ever met in my life. And especially at that time, I feel like I just wanted a mum, especially from having, obviously, my mum being missing and then going to my grandma and then my other grandma, just having a mum. No one actually sat down and said to me, oh, you're going to be going to the UK. No, I just figured it out myself and I thought, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. And especially when you come from, I would say from Africa, a lot of times in Africa, we believe that coming over to Europe is like um, Winning the I'll say a whole escape. The UK was like Hollywood. Like, you know what I'm trying to say? So for me, it was like, I'm coming to Hollywood and I'm going like, to, you know, you feel like a superstar coming off the train, off, off the plane and that, thinking, oh, like everyone's nice, everyone's lovely, people are smiling at you. You're thinking, yeah. So we was living in Kent for a bit and I'll probably say at first, um, it was kind of hard trying to understand um, the UK culture. At first, um, everything was lovely. Like, you know, I got put into a new school. I was understanding everything. Everything was lovely. I enjoyed it. But then a month in, I will say my stepmom became more, um, I would say before it was probably subtle. Like maybe you might hear um, a little, something, a little word from her where she'll be like, What you, okay, what's the word? Oh, your dad don't like you. Or like, I might ask her, is my dad coming home? Or is my dad, when, when am I going to see my dad? And she'll be like, oh, your dad's too busy for you. Or something like, little things like that. And it started with little things like Oh, she was on that type of time? Causing division? You should have told your dad, low key. That, but for me, as a child, you don't really pay attention to them things. Now that's, that's my mum. Like, and especially my dad encouraged me to call her mum too. So to me, that's my mum. So there's no, I didn't feel any type of, I just thought that like, my dad's not coming home. Then later on, it became more, the verb, I'll say the verb abuse became more and more like clear. Like, you know, literally straight up, your dad don't love you. Like, boom, your dad will never, your dad will never care for you. Like you're basically stopping us from having children. It then became physical. And when it became physical, it was then oh, like the anything, stepmom? you know, no, I didn't put a seat down in the toilet or something straight away. I'm getting beaten for it. Like maybe I didn't wash my plate in the sink. I'm getting beaten for it. Like anything and everything 
it was just basically i'm just getting beatings for everything and anything so for me that's messed up they're treating you like harry potter for me it was then it made me live in um quite hyper vigilant like quite aware of everything that was going on so even when i was sleeping i couldn't really sleep at home because most of the time I have to always listen and feel like, is she going to come in and beat me tonight? What's going to happen? That went on for a while. And even that then times it was like, I had loads of issues where even I wanted to tell my dad, my dad came back in the evenings. He was always at work. He was never around. So it was like, by the time he comes back, I'm meant to be in bed sleeping. And I don't want to be in trouble because I'm thinking she's going to beat me if, I'm in, if I get in trouble. It must be really hard. Um, That's crazy. For me at that time, I would say that I just learned to ignore the bad and try to focus as much on the good. One of them things where I learned how to protect myself and shield myself. It. So it's like mentally, I learned not to be there. So it was like, I just learned how to disassociate. So where... It's that like my body's being hit, but I'm not physically actually there. She was um, later on arrested for child abuse. Like, because it was um, like, there was things with like metal rods when being hit and hit, hit with Leaving hot things. Marks. She's never been someone to, I would say, lay hands on me outside. It's always like, wait till we get home. <laughs> wait till we get home, wait till we get home. So this time we've got back home, but before we even got, up the stairs, like we are basically at the front bit of the block. She's just literally turned around, but she had her heels on the, in her hands. So she's walking to the front door and I'm walking behind her because you see, you know, kids, when they, when they know they're in trouble, you don't really want to go home. You're, you're taking, you're dragging every single step right. till you get to that front door. As soon as I got basically close enough to the door, she's turned around and she's literally striked me with the heels of her shoes. And the first thing I felt was the wound for my blood. So it was like, okay. Like, but even, it was, I'll say I was quite shocked. Um, I remember her giving me the decisions. Um, do you want to go up the stairs or do you want to come up the lift with me? And you know, this is crazy. Like you don't really ever hear about like, you hear about child abuse use, but you really don't like, or at least I don't really hear like it the opposite way, like woman abusing the, ki the, the kids. For me at that moment in time was like, raw. I don't really want to go in the lift with you. So I'm going to go up the stairs. And I was flying up them stairs, flying up them stairs, got to the, um, this time we lived on the first floor, I think, or the second, I think the first or second. But I got to our floor and it got to a point where I'm just there now, just thinking to myself, raw. I can wait for this lift to come up or I can leave. But then where am I going to? But then also, I'm also thinking to myself, I love my dad. And it's like, I never really grew up with my dad. And this is a chance for me to basically be with my dad. But then right. I have blood. <laughs> I have blood on my face. So it was that, I call, you know what? I can't say. When I ran away, um, I obviously took the bus to the last stop. And at that time, I don't know if I fainted or I fell asleep, but Whatever happened, I literally, I woke up, I was at the last stop. And um, when I was at the last stop, I didn't know where I was. I remember going into a cab station and asking oh, the cab station for help. They told me they were helping, but instead they called the police. Okay. And That's helping. when they called the police, the police came and straight away, I was taken into the station, social services was called. Yeah, they helped in a sense. They did what they thought was best. You know, kid running there with blood on his face. And I was put into care. Yeah, I was put into care. And I was still eight. So I've not been in the U. I've not even. Damn, he's eight? I turned nine in the UK. I came into the country when I was eight. And I went into care before I turned nine. Where was your foster family? Where were you living at that time? Because obviously you were in Kent, but you moved to yeah. London, right? So where so, was the foster family? So and where was his dad when all of this is going on? Like, he was just like, whatever? Okay. That was South East London. South East London was like um, a lot more harsher than Kent. My foster carer's nephew was actively involved in gang culture. Even though he was a child himself, he was actively involved in gang culture. So I took quite a strong liking to him 
because he was the one that really, like, you know, proper, like, liked me, proper, sh- oh, yeah, what, you don't have to speak English? I can teach you, man, <laughs> you know? See, what well, gone. Oh, yeah, look at him, look how he said, what well, gone. You know what I'm saying to you? Like, it became, like, I would say we built a bond, him teaching me how to basically fit in. He took care of me. When he, I will say, clothes-wise, he made sure I had clothes. When it comes to shoes, he made sure I had shoes. When it comes to, like, dealing with certain situations in school, it was him that I called. Yeah, so, and he was always there. Like, he was always consistently there. Did you know that he was involved in, like, gang culture at all? Nah, to me, he was just a cool guy. Had loads of friends. Like, you know, dressed nice. Girls liked him. Everyone liked him. So to me, it was like, it's the right guy. Like, I like him. Like, he's cool. Like, it didn't look like, oh, you know, some scary person. And then all of a sudden. Mm-mm. And that's the thing of it. The gangsters always look cool. They're the trendsetters. That's who everybody wants to be. Even the rappers emulate gangbangers. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Disappeared. Can't get hold of him. Can't speak, can't speak about him. Can't speak to him. And everyone's just shutting it like, oh, when I asked, oh, where is he? Shortly after that, it was then that transitional period of yes, like leaving your six and going into your seven. So now I'm at age where I would say that I'm being given a lot more leeway where you can go to the park for a couple of hours, chill with your friends, chill, like literally have fun. And obviously I had a, a BMX where the BMX had the pegs at the front and the pegs at the back. Yeah. So for me, straight away, I thought, cool kid. Guy in- 100%. Got one of them, you know what I'm saying? Back in my day, we had the dinos and the GTs, and then, then the GT dinos. And then it got a little older, we had Mongoose. I think Huffy was in there too, but Huffy was a lower tier. But we, if you had a GT or a GT dino, you was in the game. Through the park, the girls trying to chat to me. Obviously, they got a couple of bears with them, but they don't care about the bears. They're trying to chat to me. <laughs> so me, I'm thinking, yeah, thumbs up. But later on, the boys started asking me to go take things to houses for them. So for me, it was like, I was, I'll say I was given a choice where it was like, cool, you can either let us go on your bike to go drop it, or you can go drop it for us. For me at that moment, I was like, oh, I don't want you to go on my bike. Right. Right. I don't want you to, I don't want you to be on my bike. You might not bring it back. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'll go drop it. Then, you know, it started with the park, then we started, we moved out of the park. Then after me moving out of the park, we started chilling in the area, the local blocks, the local areas and that, walking around. And obviously me, I'm like- Like no gang member's sto- origin story is different. There was some type of family trouble in the beginning, some type of uprooting or something that happened with the family. They met somebody. They were doing some type of stuff as a kid, then it snowballed into something else. My BMX, I'm going everywhere, like, you know, and we're now in a group, like, there's a group of us, we're kids, like, they're a couple of years older than me, but we're still kids. They introduced me to their elders, and straight away, I would say the tone changed straight away, even when I was introduced to the elders, where it was like, it, they got straight to business. It went no, oh, you know, less, no, let's break him in. Nah, it was not. Nah, it was straight away. Raw. Did you have to go away for a week? And I'm like, go. And they put you on lo- county lines that quick. Wait, so go away for a week? Where? Like, do what? Like, what's going on? And they like to me, oh, like go away for a week. Go chill with your friends. The same thing you're doing here, just chilling with your friends, isn't it? When I was taken, I would say on that journey alone, there were like probably other kids with me. But then other kids were dropped to other locations. And I was one of the last kids to be dropped to my location. And when I was dropped to my location, it was then where I say reality started sinking in, where it's like, I was meant to be chilling with my friends. Now I'm in this house by myself with just the oldest. None of my friends are here with me. When I came into the house, it was like really dirty. So for me straight away, it was like, ooh. Nah, nah, listening to his story, because some people get on here and they title it grooming, and they really don't be grooming. 
But this is like 100% grooming. Bro did not. Bro got bamboozled. He got tricked into it. He ain't know what was going on. Because, you know, whether a lot of y'all believe it or not, some kids be wanting this lifestyle. Point blank, period. The heroes was the drug dealers on the corner. That's all they were able to see because families couldn't afford TV. They ain't know what no basketball, no football, no actor was. You know what I'm saying? They seen the people on the corner with the nice cars and the nice clothes, and they wanted to be like them. That's the reality of it, man. And, you know, it is what it is. But, no, he definitely got groomed, 100%. Right. Where do I sit? Like, am I allowed to sit on this chair? Like, dirt. When I say dirty chair, like, we're talking old chair, scruffy, like, holes and everything. Everything just looks mad. <laughs> and then there was, like, loads of foil, like, foils on the, on the table. Loads mm. of ash. Like, it was kind of, Raps. like, stink of smoke. Like, a strong smell of smoke. And I was introduced to banking straight away. So, for context, plugin where I obviously um, where I put a package basically up my bum. Yeah, that's the best way to explain it. I put a package up my bum, and me straight away, I'm thinking, what banking? What do you mean bank it? Like, what are you talking about bank it? Like, what does that mean? Like, whoa! And one of the olders basically done it in front of me, so demonstrated it, showed it to me. They had you doing that at nine, eight, nine? For me straight, I'm thinking, a bit strange, but if he's doing it, it must be okay. Like, it must be all right. It must be, and especially like not understanding this culture. For me, I'm thinking that like, this is must be how kids are. Like, this is how it is, like normal. Right, they got them one. Low key, that's messed up. They, they took advantage of this man. He was a straight foreigner, didn't know the culture, didn't understand what America, I'm not, I'm not America, my bad, the UK was like, he thinking this is normal. So I'm thinking, okay, tried it. After I tried it, I'm going to lie to you, for me, it was weird at first, like I thought to myself, right, oh, this does not feel right, this does not make sense, but okay. Like, it was weird at first, then they explained to me the difference between, they said to me, this is light and this is dark. If the person comes for two light, you get out of this white pack. If the person comes for two light and one dark, you get two light out of this white part pack and you get the dark out of this dark pack. So it explained to me like the color, the color codes and everything. So I said, okay, makes sense. You receive money and when the person goes out and it comes back in. So the guy that lives in the house, he comes, he takes the, what, what, the stuff he asks of me, he goes out and he brings back money. To me, this is like a magic trick. I'm like, okay, this is calm, like, this is not a problem. And looking back now as an adult, like, we all know the terminology for what yeah. happened there. It's county lines, right? 100%. What is county lines? Um, county lines is more of a factor where young people are sent to different locations to go sell drugs or transport drugs. So it don't actually have to be uh, you're selling drugs in a spot. It can be just a fact of you moving drugs from London just from South East London to West London, or even for the fact of just moving it from literally one street to another street, like that is another form of county line. So it's just to transport the county bit is the area mm -hmm. and the line bit is that train line. Even time comes, you know, the oldest to be literally to come take me. But also before then, I will say that they, before they left, they made it look like they're just going away for an hour. So this is that me that will be back in a oh, second. I'll be right back. Don't worry. And I'm thinking, okay, cool. They'll be back soon. And that's all right. Seven days later. Wait until late evening. End up probably falling asleep. And no one came. So for me, it was that, okay, no one's here. The next day has come. I'm hoping someone's going to come today. But the addict keeps on coming, coming, coming. No one still came. Then the third day has come. And now I'm praying, like, Rav, yo, my foster carer must be worried. A lot of stuff must be going on, right, raw. Ram, they're definitely coming today. No one still came through the daytime, but the evening now, I heard a knock on the door. And hearing a knock on the door, I'm thinking to myself, Rav, boom, yeah, time to go home. Happy, literally straight away, Another pack. I've had a shotgun being pointed at me. Oh, you was getting robbed. But at first it was being pointed at, first you would see the addict come through the door 
but then straight away you see the shotgun change direction from the addict and straight away being pointed at me. So at first I was like, some, I was thinking to myself, okay, that this is a bit, <laughs> but. Was that the first time you'd ever seen a gun? Yeah. That for me was that at that point I thought to myself, I was going to die. They basically led me with the shotgun to be sat down, I sat down. And at this time I was like 10. I was like 10, like, yeah, that stage between your 60 and 11. So I was at like 10, 11. And no one's really talking, like, no one's really talking. They're just, literally, as soon as this one person has come, like, in. That's the people who brought you there. They set you up for the okie dog. Robbed you. They robbed you for their own stuff and then told you, told you, you owed them probably. Was that the script? And, uh, I'll say in a blur of my vision, I'm seeing loads of people, like, trash the whole place. Like they're looking for something or looking for someone. And this person had a shotgun being pointed at me. He just like proper like staring at me. And I'm sat on the sofa and he's proper staring at me, staring at me. Then he's obviously put down his balaclava down and he's asked, uh, he's asked me, what am I doing here? And straight away recognition is hit that, oh, this is my man that chose with my foster carer's nephew. Is that? What was he doing here? So who were they? They were my foster carer's nephew's friends. See. But at that moment in time, it did not click that this is actual a gang. This is a gang problem. Like this is actual gang warfare. But I'm just sitting there thinking that, oh, they come to get me. And thank God you came to get me. So when they were asking me questions like, oh, what are you doing here? When did you get here? Me. Obviously, in the streets, we believe there's no snitching. And that's how I grew up, no snitching. By that moment in time, I was 11. I didn't really understand no street code. I was singing a cappella. I was snitching from the roof, like, yo, oh, they brought me up, they brought me this day. I've been here. They, they're like, no one's came. No one's answering the phone. Like, raw, I can't believe it. I want to go home. Like, what? what's going on? So they took you away from that house? They took me, they took me with them back to London. And they took me back home. So yeah, when they were taking me back home, on, on the way back now, I had a parcel, which at the time I didn't know was drugs, but it was drugs. And I, the, and I also had a different parcel, which was basically money. So at that time, and being in a car, I asked them, Ron, what do I do with this? Like, what do I do with these two Good. parcels? One of the oldest that like, I've keep it. Like, we don't care for that, keep it. Oh. And taking the money and drugs from the safe house, Sosa found himself at in the center of a war between two London gangs, yep. The first gang believed he had betrayed them and started to threaten him to return their stuff. I started getting phone calls. And when I'm getting phone calls, straight away it was like, rah, boom, you robbed us. You robbed us, what way to we catch you? Like, you robbed us, you robbed us. If you don't have the money, we don't have the drugs, are coming after you and your foster care. I need to find help or I need to, I need someone to save me. I also felt people. like I needed to speak to an adult. So um, we had a looked after child review, which is called a lack review, but social services didn't really know about county lines, modern day slavery, kids being involved with selling drugs and everything else. So it was a, I think this might be the first actual case where somebody really got groomed that I've watched. On Lad Bible, at least. Like, I already gave y'all the description of what really be going on. But this is like a for real, this is for real. <laughs> Me explaining to them in a lack review that this is what's happening. For them, like, raw, oh, this can't be happening. You're a child. Now, nah, literally, this must be all in your head. You must have made this up. It can't be happening. So, me leaving that review, I sat there and thought to myself, these people aren't going to help me. And at that moment in time too, I also felt like my life is still in danger. So it was like, cool, what do I do next? And then it's like, I looked at already my foster carers, nephew's friends as saviors. So went I went back, back to, to them. them. Right. And it's basically the, the gang that I was with now, they used the fact of me not feeling safe and obviously scared for my life as a way to basically, I'll say it grew me to use firearms for them. So they basically 
help. I'll say they use that as a way to. I would say turn me into their little soldier. Mm -hmm. And what does being a soldier in a gang involve? Selling drugs. Um, involved in quite violent acts. I say is this literally is money, it's money, beef, and power. That's the best way to put it. Yeah, it's money, beef, and power. So when I say beef, war, and power. I guess this new gang, they help you protect yourself. Yeah. How did they do that? So first of all, it was a fact of like, when I first met them, they basically first explained to me the situation I was in and told me that, oh, it doesn't matter about the drugs or the money. They're going to kill you either way. They think that, oh, boom, you're with us. And because they think you're with us, they're on you anyway. So blood, like, you need to make sure you're good. You need to make sure you're protected. I'm not gonna lie, they wasn't lying on that part though. That's probably what the thought process was. We got you anyway, we're gonna make sure you're good. I was given a way to protect myself and I was given a revolver. I was given a revolver 380, which is a firearm. How old are you? At that time I was 11. How did it feel seeing a gun and holding it for the first time? I would say for me at that time too, yeah, it was like, Gun became quite known. For this period of time, I will say for a couple of months, I saw a lot of guns. <laughs> it's kind of mad, but I saw a lot of guns. Like literally for them couple of months, it was like, I saw a shotgun. Then I'll probably say in less than three months, now I have a revolver with everyone in that space having guns. I didn't really feel out of place. It was like, for me not to have a gun, I will be out of place. Like, that's how it felt at that moment in time, is that you need to have a gun to be in place. And were you given one for your birthday? No, that was, I was given that gun. <laughs> for my 12th birthday, I was given a shotgun and a bulletproof vest. For your 12th birthday? Yeah. Why did you get that as your birthday present? Because at that time, from 11 to the age of 12, I was taught how to strip a firearm, how to put the firearm together, how to use a firearm, how to hide firearms in cars, how to transport it anywhere and everywhere. So then on my 12th birthday, it was a fact of, oh, I've like basically hit gift. everyone else's firearms for the last year. Oh, it's time for you to have your own. And yeah. Right of passage. Am I right in thinking during this time you had quite a lot of violence inflicted on you as well? But, um, before I was arrested, I was shot twice. I was shot in my elbow and also my knee. And then I was, um, I ended my stomach, um, stabbed ribs, a couple of inches away from my spine, both shoulders, Aye. my back, yeah, everywhere. <laughs> Why? Yeah, everywhere. Um, I was the youngest um, recruit. And even in my bar at that moment of time, I was slightly the youngest recruit from my bar at that moment of time too. So it was like for the olders, I was the one sent to do a lot more things. So I was quiet, it was quiet. I can explain it. The reputation built quite easily, mm -hmm. where it was like, oh, they will send a little 11 year, old, 11 year old child in a uniform to come do something to you. Now they won't send one of them, or you won't see them in a car. You might just see a little kid and he has a gun on him. <laughs> I became slightly one of the most hated kids <laughs> quite quick too. That like, really became one of the most hated kids quite quick because it was that like, people were scared, but then also, People didn't, I said people didn't take time to probably understand what was going on. Yeah. They were just scared. And can you tell me about the time that you were shot? What happened? Obviously, um, the rules and regulation for my block at that moment of time was that you don't leave without your gun. So we don't want to see you on a block without a gun or without a knife or without any some sort of tools because at that moment of time, conflict was quite high. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times enemies were coming to the block shootings, stabbings. So the rules was always have your thing on you. But at this moment of time and at this day, I was doing block shifts and block shifts are like, basically a young person might do a day shift, which is like a literally probably like the same thing you don't do work nine to five and all these type of things. Just a day shift can be from 6 a.m. in the morning to 6 p.m. in the evening. Mm -hmm. And then our next young person is doing 6 p.m. to 6, 6 a.m. in the morning. So a lot of times at this time, 
I was kicked out of school. So I was doing a lot of day shifts. So in doing a lot of day shifts, um, Police be meant around. that, you know, people come a lot more. <laughs> people came a lot more. And in people coming a lot more, I had an encounter with enemies who came to my block to have, obviously, to have a problem with the gang I was involved with at that moment in time. Straight away, they identified me and it was a fact of I identified them too. So I started running away. But in, the run, in running away, I was shot. How old were you when you got shot? First time I was shot, I was 12. And in the space of oh, a year, yeah, in the space of that year, so I was shot the first time 12 and the year, in that year, I was shot again in my legs. And like psychologically, you're still really young, right? You're 14, mm -hmm. you're 12, 13, 14. Well, what are you thinking during this time? I came into this country as a child that wanted the best. But then at that time, I was living in survival. It was literally just surviving. And I was constantly in survival where I couldn't leave without a bulletproof vest. And even walking on the street, I couldn't walk on the street without having some sort of firearm or weapon on me because... Man, that's how Chicago be, I swear to God. <laughs> You grow up in Chicago, you look a certain way. Even if you're not involved, bro, you going to carry that iron. I don't care what nobody's got to say. And I will never tell nobody not to carry that iron because I know what it's like. I know what it's like. And you're not going to mistake an identity me. Oh, I thought he was a different member. But the, nah, buddy. We're going to have a bang out. I can't go like that. Allegedly. It's what the thought process is. It's a lot of people in Chicago. I knew it. the people that were coming after me, they had weapons too. And how long were you in that situation where you were kind of carrying out this gang's wishes as a soldier? Um, till I was 13, 14, where I was arrested for my um, first ever case, possession of a shotgun with a certificate mm. and GBH of intent, which was dropped. After his arrest, Sosa was intro wait, wait. After his arrest, Sosa was introduced. Oh my god, L Reader. After his arrest, Sosa was instructed by his gang to go on the run to avoid serving time in prison. Sosa was trialed in the absence where fellow gang members pinned the crimes on Wow. Fellow gang members pinned the crimes on him? Ain't that snitching? There's no honor amongst thieves, though. So they told you to run so they can pin it all on you. That's tough. Very tough. Captured and spent four months. But then when I came out of jail, I'll say it really hit. And that's when I, I'll probably say the blurred line is of when... Um, a victim is not seen as a victim no more, but now seen as a perpetrator. Because mm. for me, even when I came out of jail, is now I look to them as, um, I look to them as f flawed. Because it was like, you stuck, you gave me a code that even you couldn't stick to. Right. You said to me, no snitching. But Immediately you told someone to snitch on me in court. Doesn't make sense. But then I couldn't, inflict violence because it was like, right, I know these people and these people are my people. So it was a lot of times where I was having a lot of clash with them where they might want me to do something and now I'm on this, no. <laughs> I learned to say no. Yeah, I learned man, to say, brother, know. I'm not doing that, bro. Like, I'm, I'm not on. At the end of the day, I stuck to the G code and you, <laughs> and you, you snitched on me. I don't owe y'all nothing, y'all owe me. It's a no, buddy. And I should up rank at that point. No, like literally, and it was like, what? You're not on that. I remember I refused to do something. And one of my olders basically put in the fact of, raw, if you don't do it, I'm going to shoot your brethren. It's that simple. And it was like, okay. Okay. Logically, I take it in. But the same thing, my friend took that in too. And the rest of the, of the whole group that at, my, at my age, we took that in too. Yeah, that, ain't, that, that was a bad move by an OG. That was a bad move. That's the, that's what we on? Like, literally, you don't care for us. Yeah. And when we understood that, that's when that bloodline switched. 
where now we know violence. We don't know anything else. You taught us how to be rascals and wild, literally wild kids. And that's exactly what we gave them. We gave them wild kids and they hated us for it. They hated us for it. It's like having a dog, and it's gonna sound mad what I'm gonna say, but it's having a dog and you keep on beat, like beating up the dog, beating up the dog. Then you wonder why the dog bit you. Yeah. Like, of course the dog's gonna bite you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, and that's exactly what happened for my olders. Like they end up start getting bitten. Yeah. So we had full on conflict with our olders where we was basically our war with our olders and we were trying to explain to our olders that we don't want to be doing what they're telling us to do no more. We want to be done. When what is this? What is this? Who? What gang is this? What green? Who is he? Who is that you talking about? He wanted them. What gang is that? Again? Did you get out? And how did you get out of the gangs? Um, I would definitely say, for me, it wasn't so much about out, and that's something that I need to even get clear. Like. I really and truly fought for my freedom from the age of 16 to like 18. And then when I was uh, just after I turned 19, my oldest gave me a choice of having a firearm at 6 p.m. and was told that if I hold this firearm to the next to the next day, that everything's all right, we don't have an issue, everything's squashed. When I done that, 4 a.m. in the morning, I was being raided by armed police because they had intel that I had a firearm in the house. Bro. Oh, these olders got no. Oh, they some snitches. Oh my God. They wanted you off the streets because you was too dangerous at that point. So they snitched you off the streets. That's tough. I mean, that's that's some common stuff though. But that's the dude. They gangs do that to their enemies all the time. The mob, like they do that to their enemies all the time. But doing it to your youngers because you you created savages that are too savage for you to deal with. It's crazy. Also, because for the olders, it was pretty much like we couldn't kill these little kids, so let's get rid of them. So I was arrested and I was sentenced to five years. But in this five years, I was given a deportation order. And when I was given this deportation order, I didn't really know what to do. I remember telling my solicitor my story from the start to the end. And I also remember telling her it was going to be a long week for her. And she's telling me, yep, let's go, let's go, let's go. I can do it. You know I mean? And then she then introduced me to the psychologist. And I've done the same thing with the psychologist, spoke to the psychologist. But I had to explain my story from the start to the end, everything. And after that, they both came in the room and told me, oh, you've been groomed. They didn't really register to me that, oh, you know, the people, the people over me, they might have influenced. Nah, they double tapped you too. They, tapped, they double groomed you. To me, in my head, is just like, oh, I'm the one that is actually doing all the stuff. So it's on all on me. And at first, I remember this lady talking to me about trauma. And I'm thinking, bro. You the first group definitely groomed you. The second group used your trauma to manipulate you into doing what they wanted you to do. Which is like, yeah, it's, I guess it's a form of grooming. But they used the trauma that you had, which... They manipulated it, the situation, to fit their agenda. And you fell into it because you wanted the protection. You're lost. We you talk trauma, me, trauma. And I'm thinking, bro, you're lost. We you talk trauma, me, traumatized. <laughs> I caused the trauma. What are you talking about? That don't make sense. We started speaking more. She started explaining things. Like, we started talking about my little scars and where my scars came from. I didn't know how to move forward. I really didn't know how to move forward. I was quite stuck and it was quite easily for me to be re-exploited. Me and my trauma, trauma worker, we've been speaking about how would I like the system to look like? How, how do I think prison should look like? How do I think service should work with young people or pe young people who are currently being exploited and all these type of things. So we were speaking about it, speaking about it. But for me, it was all talk, like, you know, nothing like, I, I don't, I, it's not going to happen. Like, no one's going to listen to me. I'm just a child. <laughs> like, I'm just, the, the, even then, I was not just a child, but to me, it's that like, I'm no one. No one's going to listen to me. I wanted to change professionals' perspective because at the end of the day, every room I step, step into, people look at me and think, oh, should he be here? Shouldn't he be here? Because I've got gold teeth, I've got long hair, I look a certain type of way. So. I love that. I love that, though. 
I love that. When I'm the only face like mine in the room, when I walk in there, oh man, that do something to my, that do something to me. I'm like, oh yeah. Let's end racism today. <laughs> For me, that's how I be <laughs> Oh yeah. Let's get her done. Let's prove some people wrong, man. I'll be using that as motivation. I just wanted to change that perspective first. I'll say one of the most enjoyable moments that I do have now is being a voice for the unheard. Like, able to speak for my young people in my community. Able to speak for the pe young people that who feel like their voice is not being heard in different type of rooms. And, yeah, I'll say that's, that. that's how life is for me now. And obviously now I've got dreams and aspirations where before it was just, you know, hope I live to the next day, you know? <laughs> See, man, that's why I wish I could get some type of real, some real, like, like, I got enough on YouTube, but, like, I need some real capital, you know what I'm saying? So I can go back to these communities, starting with mine, and, and like, build stuff for the kids. You know what I'm saying? That's like, I build a community center in every hood. And yeah, it's for the kids, brother. <laughs> it's for the kids. You charge for a couple of things. Put a put a fitness workout area in it. Boom. Charge somebody monthly for that. But the rest, the kids want to come hoop. Let them hoop. Do what they do. Pool. Like let them let them chill. The security up there. Keep it calm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's not be dumb. But you know what I'm saying? Let's do something. Y'all leave a like comment.